Is that right? No. That's terrible. No, that's pretty good shape. A Tonka toy. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I was gonna say, that I'm sorry. I yeah. forgot. I we're talking about Tonka toys. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Do they even make time? All set? Yeah, it looks like it's it. It's one o'clock. I'm going to call the August 2nd Board of Commissioner meeting to order. We'll start out our meeting with a prayer from Commissioner Sarkello, followed by the pledge by myself. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, for the opportunity to gather and take care of our county's business for our friends and neighbors. We're grateful, Lord, that we live in a country where we can vote and exercise our right to vote and participate. We ask that you be with us in all things. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, gentlemen. Leslie, roll call, please. District 1 Chairman John Black. Present. District 2 Commissioner Gary Heberly. Here. District 3 Commissioner Bill Sarkella. Here. District 4 Commissioner Roger Ballard. Present. District 5 Commissioner Joel Wyatt. Here. Thank you, Leslie. At this time, we'll move on to adoption of today's agenda. There is one thing to be removed from today's agenda. That is FA051-21. If there is nothing further, I'll entertain a motion to approve today's agenda as amended. So moved. We're, we have a motion from Commissioner Ballard, support from Commissioner Heberling. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Uh, aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to the approval of our meeting minutes from July 19th. If there are no additions cor or corrections or deletions, I'll entertain a motion to approve. So move. Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Wyatt, support from Commissioner Sarkella. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Your correspondence would have been in your email the other day from Jody. So we will move on to commissioner reports and we will start with Commissioner Sarkella. I was able to attend uh, Santa Lake Township's uh, fire and EMS uh, millage informational meeting. Uh, a lot of the community was there and they did a really good job with the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the village of Lexington had a DDA public hearing there. They're going to do a proclamation for uh, Al Vandergraaf, which uh, who's a community member that passed away there. And um, they're also uh, rezoning a marketplace and uh, discussing chapel window repairs there. If you've never been down there, they have a really nice chapel at their cemetery, copper roof and everything. It's pretty impressive. And then Lexington Township, uh, their ARPA money's in and they're looking at their Black, Black River drain assessment and continuing to uh, discuss the bike path with Croswell. However, Croswell, if you've been down there lately, have their big sewer project going on. So unfortunately, that's kind of at the back burner, but they're trying to get MDOT back involved because they're the ones that originally paved it and it is in pretty sad shape. And then Croswell last night, they're discussing potential for ambulance millage. Uh, final paving uh, should be happening there. So a lot of that construction will be done. And they're also looking at um, money for their water tower in the future. That's all I have at, uh, from meetings attended. Thank you, Bill. Gary? Yep. I have attended um, this last month um, all our township meetings, Watertown, Washington, Rich Hampton, and um, more township. And I've also had conversations with um, Carl Ostentowski and our city manager here in Sandusky over some property that's overgrown uh, leading back to the high school. And I uh, also had a couple conversations last couple of days uh, with our city manager, uh, Dave Faber, in regards to the waste process at uh, the city. So and then Dave is going to be here today to speak to us. So, yeah. Thank you, Gary. Uh, I myself had another conversation with Minden Township Supervisor Terry O'Connor. Um, just like Commissioner Wyatt indicated years ago about the wind project coming to uh, townships in the southern part of the county, people that live in the northern part of the part of our county should be aware that solar, uh, large scale solar implementation is on its way. So if you're interested or have questions about those issues, attend your township board meetings. Beyond that, I also met with the airport um, manager, Don Johnson today, related to uh, Airport Zoning Board of Appeals issues. We're aware that there's likely going to be an application from uh, Liberty Wind for a variance to the county zoning ordinance related to uh, tall structures, which is limited at 500 feet. And we're starting the preliminary process of making sure that we're prepared for that application to come in. That's all I have, Roger. 
Uh, since the last meeting, I attended the Buell Township and Elk Township meetings. Really not, not a lot going on. They're getting, trying to get their road uh, upgrades uh, in place, the brining and graveling of roads. Uh, City of Marlette, I was supposed to go last night, but they moved it to two weeks. And that's about it for townships. Thanks, Roger. Joel? Well, Worth Township had a, a meeting that was interesting. Um, they had two of them, actually. One was a short-term rental. Um, they came up with an ordinance for that. I don't remember if I mentioned that the last time. And then they had their ordinary board meeting, um, which was not, nothing uh, Nothing really big came out of that. Uh, Fremont Township, however, was a little bit different. Um, there was a packed crowd. I'm sure you read the newspaper that reported on the packed crowd that was there. Uh, a lot of questions were asked. They were looking for a, a, a moratorium. Uh, the vote, uh, the board voted against it, and um, and they had a conversation after that regarding, um, you know, um, moving forward with the questions that you uh, highlighted. Uh, um, the document from 2017 with the airport zoning board created that height restriction with a topic of of a topic of interest, I guess that was, you know, how did that come about? Why did that come about? We didn't really hear anybody from the board in 2017 that was able to give us any background. I don't know if you've heard anything. That's relatively new, you know, five years old. Why did it come about? You know, what was, what was going on at that time? Um, looked back in the meeting minutes and uh, didn't really see a whole lot, which brings to mind an interesting topic. If you recall, the clerk a couple of years ago was a little bent out of shape over the fact that Commissioner Romera at the time didn't like what she wrote in the, in the board meet, minutes. And that prompted her to find out what the statute says as far as required minutes. And since then, we've been getting a very small version of the, the meeting minutes. And it's a problem when you go back several years and you say, oh, the board, they approved this, they approved that, they had a, a motion on this or that. What was the temper? What was going on at the time? There's nothing that gives you anything to flesh that out. It's unfortunate. Um, it would be nice if uh, our clerk would be more expansive in the board minutes. And I, and I think, you know, and I haven't researched the statute on this. I'm glad we're having this conversation now since I got the floor. But statutorily, this is our clerk to take the board minutes, which means if we're asking for additional information on board minutes, we should be able to ask for that and receive that, correct? Correct. But there's a, a fine line that I cannot give an opinion or make it perceive that or give any kind of opinion. And that's that's totally acceptable. But we've been working for the last two years or so, two and a half years under abbreviated minutes. And I think it would be useful if this board considered asking the clerk to expand on those minutes to to, to flesh out the general temperament of the discussions for motions in particular. You know, the, the recording of what I'm blathering on about right now, not as big of a deal. But when we have a motion that opens up a support thus a discussion, it would be nice to have those minutes reflect the general understanding of what that discussion was about. Uh, uh, Joel, I think we can do that, but any organization or words I've been on, they, they cut that back, just like Leslie said, so there's no opinion, because it, it can lead to, I don't know if it can lead to a liability issue, but they can go back and say, well, they, you know, uh, so most boards, most well, minutes are, are kept to a, a minimum. Any place I've been. Well, I know going back and researching, right? If any of you guys have done that, gone back to, I've, I've gone to Jody's office multiple times. Hey, what, what was the motion that was made back then? Heck, we have one right on the back of here, right? Mm -hmm. And you can go back there and, and sometimes you can get an idea of what they were discussing at that time. Other times you got a motion and you have no understanding of what was discussed at that time. And there's nobody left in the, the office that can, that can explain that to you. And it, it's, a, um, it's a detriment for making sound decisions going for, 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 uh, forward, particularly when we're reviewing past precedent setting motions. It would be good to review that. So more, a little bit more would be, would be great. Yeah, you don't have to interject your own personal opinion on it. That was a, I feel like that particular episode where Denise dialed that back was a result of a, a, a bombastic 
rhetoric on the part of one commissioner who, you know, I mean, we have recorded, right. We, we could go back and figure out who said what, right. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that you'd be willing well, to just do? The Robert rules of order state that is, it is only to be written what was done, not what was said. What was done and what not what was said. Yeah. Yes. What was handled and not what was said. Maybe it would also be very difficult for a clerk to add context and not be accused of adding opinions to it. How does one, though, keep a record of that going forward? And I've noticed this in township meetings as well. I, you know, we're townships in my district. And man, I'll tell you what, you know, those meetings are always hot, right? And they're always referencing back what was done three, four, five years ago. And nobody can find a record that indicates what was done three, four, five. The action taken, yes, but not what led to that action. How does one incorporate that then? I mean, Robert's rules of orders is great. I would imagine that you could have some expanded dialogue recorded there, or I guess we, 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 we film it, and we keep it forever. Yeah, the server is full of at least a couple years since we yeah. started. Okay. Croswell City Council was called on this very thing. Yeah. And during public comment, mm -hmm. and the clerk replied that by the statute, just what Leslie mm -hmm. said, what was what was done, not what was said yeah. mm -hmm. yeah, by statute. Because yeah. they were questioning about her opinion on, you know, and no, she, she has to do it that way. Yeah. I, I mean, personally, I really like the idea that the meetings are recorded, that they're posted publicly for the, the public to view. I'm sure that people within county government utilize those videos to go back and, and see what was said or what was done. So as long as that public record can be maintained, I think the status quo with how the meeting minutes are being handled would suffice. Yeah. So, but. well, yeah, that's my report. Thank you, Joel. Good discussion by everybody. Thank you. At this time, we'll move on to our administrator's report. Nathan. Thank you. So first thing, all the budgets have been submitted. There's a couple exceptions with mostly all the budgets. Preliminary budgets have been submitted and um, I'd really like to thank the department heads and elected officials that we've done a preliminary review and it looks like people are working very hard to try to maintain um, what they can within their budget without asking for any um, unnecessary increases. So um, we're also expected to see the, the second tranche of our ARPA funding should be coming through. Hopefully sometime this week, Okay. we finalized to get that pushed through. There were some steps that had to be taken. So um, you guys will see there is a resolution before the board today regarding the lease of the old Michigan State Police Building. Um, that's been a work in progress. I kind of walked into that. I know um, Nick Lusher did some work on it. I believe Gary did some work. We've been providing a lot of landscaping, snow removal, and we really hadn't been receiving anything for it. So they needed an update to the lease. Um, they needed a resolution as part of that. And then once we can get that taken care of, they will start, um, I guess, paying us for the service, which would be good. So we're no longer gonna be maintaining that um, just as, I guess, because as part of our property, we're gonna get a kickback for that, which will be nice. Um, I met with Carl Asentoski from the Economic Development Office in Huron County, also serves as San Lac County. Um, we had some good discussions about what he does and how he services this county here. Um, he did say he has a, a like it almost like an on-call status. He's not here physically all the time, but he is available to be at city managers or um, you know the county as needed. Um, and he was just at our uh, master plan, the San Juan County master plan um, meeting last week. So, which I did attend the master plan committee meeting. Um, the group is exploring the strengths and weaknesses we have within the county um, and looking at ways to promote some of the strengths we have and how we can do things to um, promote the county um, and how we can reach not only those within the county, but also those outside the county so that we can maybe bring more people into the county as well, um, whether they're here for vacations or whether they're looking to relocate. So um, I think we have some, we've had some good discussions. They're looking at things like housing. They're looking at the technology. They're looking at uh, cell phone service. Some of those barriers that sometimes would prevent people from coming to the 
to the county and how we can overcome some of those obstacles. So very good. All right. Thank you. Nathan, on the topic of ARPA, as we're discussing the second tranche of funding coming in, you know, we have a really strong ARPA committee that's been developed of, you know, our finance director, our treasurers included on that. We've got a couple of commissioners included on it, yourselves included on it. But I almost feel like we need to uh, involve this full body somehow. So in the near future, should we have some kind of a collaborative meeting so that everybody can see, you know, where we've what we've done so far, what the game plan moving forward is so that we can really develop a super sound plan for that. Yeah, I think I think that would be good. I think there's some good ideas of maybe what we need to focus some of those finances on. I think it'd be good to bring those to the board's attention to get maybe their approval to see if they align with what the ARPA committee is looking at. And then we could really prioritize some of those um, requests, I think, and look at what we need to preserve or move forward with, look to move forward with eventually and what ones maybe at this point should be eliminated, so. And we might be well set up to do that within the next month. I mean, Buildings and Grounds is gonna be meeting later today to provide some solid recommendations on some of the building projects to the ARPA committee. But then maybe once they're done with that aspect of it, we can involve everybody in it and get a, a conversation going. Yeah, I think that would be positive. Okay, good, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Nathan? Hearing none, we'll move on. Thank you for your report, Nathan. Uh, public comments pertaining to today's agenda. Are there any public comments pertaining to the agenda today? Hearing none, we will move on to a presentation, Region 7 Agency on Aging, Bob Brown. Bob, welcome. Yes. Uh, Thank you. The podium is yours. <coughs> You got. I have handouts. Oh, I thought you had candy in the bag. <laughs> <laughs> I hope valuable information. Thank you. I think we included a free pen, so you remember it. Because <laughs> you know, area agencies on aging, even though we're so valuable, people forget that we're there. Very important work that you do. Yeah. Right now, right? <laughs> Those are a no no, right? Yeah, it's a clicker for me. <laughs> Just take the spring out of it. So, so, first off, I'm Bob Brown, I'm the executive director of Region 7 Area Agency on EG. And it's been my honor to be serving in that capacity for the last five years. Prior to that, I served for 20 years at a area agency on aging down in Southeast Michigan. Um, moved up here to retire. My predecessor asked me if I'd apply, and my son would tell you, now I'm living in my retirement home, and, and they're helping me pay for that. So it's a, it's a good thing. And I get asked what an area agency on aging is. We're the umbrella organization for a lot of senior services, such as Meals on Wheels, um, transportation for seniors in a niche way, um, and home care in the home instead of a nursing home for our most vulnerable seniors, um, veterans, disabled veterans, and, and that. So we provide that service. So we provide, we help subsidize 3,000 meals a day across 10 counties. And we take care of 900, over 900 seniors on a daily basis in their home so they can stay there. We were formed um, going on to 40 years now by 10 counties, uh, and, in, and includes Sanilac County. Um, and it was formed as a 501c3. And the reason that you have a regional agency is because by the Older Americans Act, you have to have a certain geographic size and um, census. So no one county in the 10 counties that formed the agency many, many years ago to work on their behalf um, could be an area agency on aging. Not even if you took Saginaw Bay and Midland, they, couldn't, they don't have enough um, population to be one. So the idea is to be the regional umbrella. Our main service is to be the um, overseer of the Older Americans Act and Older Michiganians money that's distributed to the counties and 
your council's on aging. And in the case of Sanilac, you utilize HDCs to deliver many of those services. And we usually have a contract. Well, we always have a contract. Anyways, with that said, <laughs> the other reason is area agencies on aging, except for two services, basically case management and um, transportation can't do direct services. We do do some direct transportation. We do do case management, uh, but we do do direct services. But most of that is, I'll, I'll give you a big example, is taking a veteran down to the VA hospitals downstate Ann Arbor and Detroit. So where the local can't do it, we try to subsidize that or fill in a little niche. We don't want to do what the public transportation can already do. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. And that. So we appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate that Christine Lee is your appointment to my board. Again, you are my governing board. So from time to time, I'd like to come and give that update of who we are. But more importantly, to talk to you fiscally, you're my fiscal oversight by your appointment. I also like to thank uh, that you appointed Bill Walters to the advisory board. He also became chair of the advisory board, and upon achieving that, he sits on my board of governors also besides the advisory board. Um, for the last five years since I've been here, we've had unqualified opinions, no recommendations. Our management letter doesn't have any advice. Just says, good job, basically. So for five years, we're very proud of that status. And if you go through your audits, you know how tough they can be. Um, so with that, the last part of my fiscal report would be in this nice little packet I gave you, and I know people are always worried about the numbers, and we are data driven, so if you take up this little sheet, it kind of gives you a story. You award us uh, the take care of expenses for the two delegates, um, $2,911, you'll see that towards the bottom. We return to the county in services not over $900,000. That's in meals and in home care and many, many other programs. It's a great return on investment. So with that, that's kind of my fiscal. If there's any questions, I would love to answer. Does anybody have any questions? I do. You said meals and wheels are one component of your umbrella agency. Where this, where is this? So, we subsidize whatever the locals are doing. We're not the full funder. Okay. Um, one other thing is we also are the overseer of the, the audits and the technical for the provider network. So it could either be us or the state. Our admin is 5.1 this year. Their admin is over 10% and sometimes as high as 15%. So that might be why not deal with the state directly well, we do it better than they do, but we do it more efficient than they do. I hope I answered. No. <laughs> so you, you, so when we look at Meals and Wheels, and I'm, not, I'm talking about ground level, my mom down in Macomb County, she's been volunteering Meals and Wheels for a long time. I go down there every other Wednesday to, to help her, right? It's fun, right? I drive her while she runs meals around. But lately, for those people who are putting forth the effort to actually deliver the meals, the red tape and nonsense that are being required on these volunteers because they get a modest uh, re re return on their mileage. That's it, you know, 38 cents, 40 cents, whatever it was at the time. But the red tape that they have to go through with when people don't take a meal because they're not there or what have you. And, and I mean, it used to take her for a route. Uh, maybe two hours, right? Mm -hmm. Now I go down there and help her. It's four hours for the same amount of people because of this, these requirements that uh, Meals on Wheels now has when you have an extra meal because someone didn't take it. You got to go back to every house and ask someone to take it. And then if you don't, you've, you've got to go through some more red tape and go back to the facility and sign all kinds of documents and forms. I, I tell my mom, I said, you, you're, you're doing this as a volunteer, right? Because I mean, extraordinary. My question to you is that has nothing to do with your umbrella agency, right? You have nothing so to do with your provider meals. of meals is HDC. We work with them. They're actually the deliverer of meals. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could probably answer that. 
there's a lot of requirements that have come, you know, to the, I always like to think of the pendulum. pendulum. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it overswings and, and then it has to come back. You know, we just went through it with the opioid crisis, pendulum swung right over here, you know, hopefully it don't go back there and it hits the center where the people that really need um, pain, you know, pain management, you get it. Same thing with meals. So you probably a few years ago read about uh, people taking care of people and all the problems like background checks and then, you know, meals, you know, people stealing food from the commissary. Hasn't happened around here that I know of, but this is a national program. So when one thing comes and, and it happens, they usually overreact. So, you know, there are rules upon rules about the actual food, the heat. You take it out, does it come back? Yeah. You can't just hand out extras. I guess what I'm saying to you by telling you this anecdotal story is to highlight most recently is was HTC, right? Mm -hmm. Had an issue where they're providing a service to people that can't otherwise have this service provided. And they have to stop because they're being treated as employees and they can't function. More red tape, more bureaucracy, more crap. Is there a way that your organization within itself and overseeing those services that you oversee can consider moving forward at reducing and making it simpler for people to provide services I, to their neighbors and to be good neighbors instead of increasing government oversight and pendulum swing where we don't need it? Commissioner, it's a great question. And they're policy makers and we can tell you who to contact. And you can write your letters to them. We carry out the things as they come down. We are working, but I want to assure you, we are working with HDC on the ruling they got from the unemployment insurance and everything like that. But um, that's the same thing that a lot of companies have gone through where they hired contracted workers and then the court defined them as employees. Um, that's something that's been out there. And I don't know how you would change that red tape because that's just the law. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's you go to court in case law has developed what an employee is and what it isn't. Um, I'm sad that it, they had an unfavorable ruling because everybody used contracted employees and things like that. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is, is like with the volunteer drivers, it's getting more painstaking uh, in reviewing them. It's not only a background check now. We got to see if they're on the Medicaid fraud list. Are they disbarred from being a Medicaid, Medicare person? There's so many rules um, that come down. We just try to maintain them, provide the technical assistance so they don't have to waste their money on attorneys and such. But sometimes that happens, you know, you end up in court. Well, that doesn't fill me with hope of reducing the size of government. I love to have a conversation, <laughs> and all the things that happen, and we can sit down with agency. I look at your your agency, which is broad, right? Covers a lot of things. And what sort of pushback that you give to lawmakers, for example, as you said, for me to write a letter, and and what, what sort of pushback do you give for action to be taken that makes the ground level work easier? So, so twenty years ago, I came into the nonprofit industry. Uh, to an area agency, I, I'm aging from the uh, um, executive position at the phone company. Mm -hmm. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I've always pushed back on red tape and bureaucracy, but then again, it's that checks and balance because people demand that uh, you combat fraud. Yep. And it's tough. It's a tough yep. call. I mean, I, I will tell you one thing I'm pushing back on right now the OIG. Office of Inspector General, we hear that name all the time. Mm -hmm. um, we used to do a report once a year. We're now doing that report four times a year, the in-depth one, and we're doing many reports every month. Um, but if I want to do these good services, I'm more than capable of handling the bureaucracy and making sure it gets there and trying to shelter that as best I can. Okay. And all I can tell you is I'm glad that I'm retiring in about three and a half years because more is coming. Because every time something happens, somebody overreacts, in my opinion, my opinion only. Mr. Brown, I appreciate your opinion because 
I don't think anybody here would disagree with we see that happening more and more. Yep. We HDC has come to us with their concerns related to the, you know, they can't provide the services to seniors the way they could. And that's a that's a huge issue for us. We want to make sure that the seniors in San Juan County have the resources to stay in their homes, maintain their homes and, and get the services they need. So we've been advocates for that. So I would simply say to you, if there's any way that we can be an assistant, we would be happy to. So in regards, we, my fiscal team is working with HCC, um, having meetings. Um, where, you know, the problem is, is if right now they have a workforce, the idea is to try and maintain that workforce to deliver those services. Um, and we're offering positions with an agency to deliver those services that we're um, is a subsidiary of ours, basically, um, to employ them as actual employees. Uh, whatever that cost is for this next year, we'll probably have to endure. But then again, it's not a direct service that we normally do. We do it in an emergency. We don't want anybody to go without these services. So our goal will be to try and put that back out to bid as a direct service again, a service that not a direct service by us, but out to a provider. Okay. So you've actually found a way to actually kind of help that in the short term. I don't know. It, it, you know, we're going to do our best. The last thing we want is a <laughs> smooth transition of providing that service. So we're in negotiation. If not nego we're in discussions with the state and HDC. We're hoping to get as many employees as we can. By the way, there's a shortage of uh, people that want to be employed in the thumb, mm -hmm. actually more so than the other seven counties. So if you know of anybody that wants to help people in their homes, send them our way. We'll try and set them up. Um, but yes, we're going to try and save as many of those employees. But a lot of those employees, they're now defined as employees, those contractors. They don't want to be employed. Um, a lot of them have said that, you know, they want just be a contract employee. They have special hours. So we're trying to work through all that as we can work with them. But also we're going to have to hire people. And so we're going through that process. So with that said, Bob, um, what's your in-home footprint or your process or your, um, what's the word I'm looking for, service look like right now with the, uh, or persons with disability that have to remain in their home. What's that look like? Is that a one day a week, two day a week? Um, the services are based on an assessment mm -hmm. that they receive by a, a nurse and a social worker team in their case. Uh, case coordination and support and things, the money that we would give to page DC, there was a lot less restrictions on those monies. So, um, so if you look, we're taking care of in home under our waiver 1915C program, 48 clients in Family Life County. So that's personal care, hygiene. That's uh, homemaking care, uh, cleaning the house, and you know whatever else needs to be done. And respite care, giving the caregiver a break. So um, but I think there's about, and don't quote me. I think we're going to be dealing with about 27 or 30 clients from HCC. Uh, I've got a team assigned to it. It's their priority. So we don't want to drop the ball come October 1st. So the contract is still in place till October 1st with HDC. So we're trying to build the capacity to handle it. You ask me, are we there today? No, we're not. But we're hoping over the next couple of months to get there. We're hoping to retain as many of the employees that those clients are already comfortable with. I mean, what better way to do it if they're willing to come on board? And then the big question is, is over the year or two, trying to work out a, another contract to have somebody else provide that service as possible. Otherwise, we'll have to maintain it internally. So those folks can be moved to other programs and uh, or maintain this one. And you're probably faced with the same thing everyone else is hiring people, right? You know, the, I, I have I've been in management for 45 years now. 45 years. 
I never could recall anybody missing their first day of work. Um, people make appointments for um, interviews, they're missing them. People are missing their orientation. But I'll tell you, I, we're over 30. I stopped counting when you hit 30. I'm going to just bluntly say that. That didn't show up for their first day of work after you made the offer and they accepted the offer. And they didn't show up, but they didn't call either. So I don't know how it's going there. Um, there's definitely a shortage of work, workers in Huron, Tuscola, and Santa Lai counties, definitely. And we're always looking for good people. So we're looking for nurses, social workers, and the actual direct care workers that go in the home and take care of the clients. So. Very good. Is there any further questions for Bob? Thank you, Bob. Nope. I hear you none. Thank you, Bob. That was a great question. Are you from the press? Anybody else want to sign? At this time, we'll move on to our second presentation of the day, and that will be from Jerry Johnson, the Santa County 4-H and MSU Extension Program Director. Jerry, welcome. Thanks for having me. Uh, I guess before we start our plan today, I was going to give you an overall update on what Extension is doing for San Juan County. And then we're going to have Betty Jo Kronicki come up. She's our Supervising Educator for Districts 9 and 10. We'll give a little more detail on 4-H. Uh, and we have some 4-H guests here to speak with you. And then I'll come back up the podium just to close. Uh, so before I start, I'm going to give you uh, some information. and sweet. Numbers are there on the floor. Thank you. So uh, I guess by way of by way of introduction, uh, kind of where are we and who are we? Um, I mean, you know, as a country, we, we lead the world in two things, father, fatherlessness and drug abuse, right? We're the best. Um, our kids are two years behind in school across the nation, in this county, uh, in, my, in the home county that I lived in. Um, COVID has put them behind. Uh, drug abuse, mental illness, depression are at unprecedented levels, never higher. Uh, and I have multiple family and friends that work in the industry, and they would verify that that is an accurate statement. Um, and that the value even of a traditional four-year degree is being questioned, right? Because I go to school for five years, I have a teacher's degree, I'm earning 40 grand, and I got 120 grand in debt. Does that make sense, right? It's all good questions and real legitimate problems. I mean, the number one reason kids in Japan are in psychiatric hospitals is internet addiction, right? And, and if we had the hospitals, that would be our case too, because that's the biggest addiction our kids have is to their cell phones. So what do we do? What does MSU do? How do we come alongside communities to help in those situations where first and foremost, we're an educator, right? We're not going to treat you, diagnose you, or tell you what to do or tell you how to do it. But we are going to provide evidence-based information to enable you to make the decisions best for you, your spouse, your family, uh, extended loved one, neighbors. So we're going to arm you with information. That's what we do. Um, so we're education. One of the good things that came out of COVID, if there was any, um, was the fact that we were well equipped to provide hybrid education. We know uh, online education does not work for kids, right? Doesn't work for 4-H either. 4-H kids don't like it, so I'm not going to tell you they do. But online education or virtual is wonderful for Mr. Brown's clientele, who's just up here. It's wonderful for caregivers who take care of somebody with dementia or they're so old they can't move around, they need help with bathing and normal everyday activities. That's great. I can actually go to something that helps me in my job and I don't have to leave the person I'm caring for. So that's been a real blessing or something that came out of unanticipated good consequence that we did not see coming. So in front of you, you'll see um, 
uh, an update here. And the first page in front of you is uh, the full year update for 2021. Again, lots of folks and, and a number, I'm gonna explain what that is, but you see 200 folks went through SNAP education, right? So we're the supplemental nutrition education provider. So seniors get their, get their coupons, but they also get education along with that to help them stretch their food dollar further. We also work with uh, youth in the SNAP ed as well. So that's something that's needed like never before. And we've certainly seen numbers uh, in my district and around the state on the increase. Um, ABI, that's agriculture and agribusiness. Again, 76 programs, nearly 400 residents from your county attended those programs. And because it's they attended, there's more than that that attended. Because if you choose, if you attend and we give you a demographic form and you choose not to fill it out, we don't count you. We can't. So it's only if somebody turns something in, can we count it? So these are very conservative numbers. This comes out of our pair system and it's not in pairs, it didn't happen. Um, we have weekly AABI virtual breakfast series for, for crop farmers, well attended. Well, it's available on YouTube, it's available on Spotify, it's available in person, very well attended by your county. Half an hour early in the morning when they have time to attend to talk about current issues. Those numbers aren't necessarily in here. Um, and that virtual breakfast is award-winning. It's been around now for three or four years. And District 10's old Phil Cates was one of the founders of that. Uh, community food environment is next. That would be things like new commissioner training, tourism, uh, sustainable communities, et cetera. Lots of different programs. CYI is uh, children and youth. That does not include 4-H reimbursement. That is an addition to 4-H. So these would be programs put on that youth in your community attend and they aren't necessarily in the 4-H program. And because they attended, uh, it couldn't mean, it doesn't mean they went for an hour. Uh, the next gap you see health and nutrition, it means if they signed up for a course, they were there four times for an hour or five times for an hour. That counts one. So one of those people was getting life uh, changing education um, if, and people that live in your, and reside in San Lac County. Only against me. Sorry, I thought I had a shut up. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you can see, then we break the next section, just break down the, the, uh, the Institute. So AABI, I won't read through all those, but you can see that we have 300 uh, residents here that attended field crop programs last year. Again, that chose to provide their information. So, well, it was well more than that. Very strong force. We're a very strong force statewide in with our farmers. Um, this district has more agriculture educators than any district in the state. It's not by accident. Um, you have six. We have one open position we're trying to fill in Tuscola County. You have six. There are districts that have zero. So, and we have a we have a field crops educator. We have a forage educator. We have a, a feedlot educator. We have the statewide meat quality expert in this district, and we have uh, somebody who's an expert in other field crop, more of an expert in beans. Um, educator. So I'm sorry. And we have a dairy educator in Huron County. So well served and you do get more than your fair share of the educators in your district, even if they're a statewide appointment, then that's not really debatable. Um, you go down to health and nutrition is the next section. And we do food safety, cottage food law, if serve safe training. If you're in St. Clair County, there's other options for serve safe. Other than that, if you're in San Lac or you're in Tuscola, we are serve safe. We are training those providers and they are required by law to have that. And Lori Messing out of Huron County does all the training for the other four counties in my district, including San Juan County. Um, and again, her attendance is one way up because people can now attend either in person or virtually. Uh, there's some of the testing and proctoring has to be done in person, but many of the courses can be done virtually. And then health has been, has, has exploded across the state and certainly my district. And in health, that would be programs like Stress Less with Mindfulness, right? It's a four to five series program. Relax alternatives to anger, um, powerful tools for caregivers. If you're taking care of that person with dementia or a senior citizen or a serious injury, the attendance has just skyrocketed. As a matter of fact, with some of my counties now, judges are volunteering, volunteering people that they will attend relax. When they come before St. Clair County, Judge Mona Armstrong, Judge Dan Damon, others, if they're not felonies, but if you're, they're in a, a court dealing with a misdemeanor, 
they're going to assign that youth or that person to go through this course. They believe in it that much, and they've seen the benefit. Matter of fact, Judge Mona Armstrong even said, would be better yet is if you attend this course before I see you in the courtroom, <laughs> or if you're already signed up before I tell you to sign up for it. So this has been very, we've had the entire St. Clair County Administration Office uh, or, or whole departments sign up for, or for the stress level of mindfulness training because they might be dealing with every day a resident calling, well, why is my tax bill so high, right? And you've got certain jobs where three out of four calls is going to be somebody complaining to you. And they need abilities. There are ways you can self-manage your stress level, right? There's one way for you to control your all three parts of your brain at the same time. Anybody you know what that is? There's only one way. It's breathing. There's things you can do to control your breathing that will control. Anybody's in law enforcement, a lot of our police officers would know that where they know it. They know it because I've seen them work with people. But if you are in that situation, the only way you can get that person out of that fight or flight or that reptilian, I'm just going to curl up into a ball. It's, you know, if, if you breathe, you can keep yourself from getting there. And there are methods to do that. Again, it's not a focus focus theory. We can't come up with theories and teach it. So very needed in your community. Right, your community is not immune from drug abuse and depression and domestic violence and kids that are by in school and kids that have disappeared off school worlds. Talk to any of the superintendents here. They're all on my list. Kids have just disappeared. They left and they never came back. Um, so it's a disturbing trick. Next section is community food environment. Again, the only thing I'll add to that is we've got a thumb food policy council that serves all the counties in the thumb. And that is a vibrant group of people. And it's really maintained. It's, we don't run it. We have folks that are on it. Actually, a retired person from extension chairs that. Um, but that has been vital. And we do still have food uh, insecurity issues throughout the state. So it's always a kind of a haves and have nots, right? And there's um, but there are folks that, that are living in cars. There are people that don't have houses. Um, and then lastly, children and youth. Uh, again, these would be things like AmeriCorps or career exploration. Um, you know, we do things, uh, exploration days where youth go to MSU campus. And Betty Jo is one of the organizers for that. And they learn, what is it like? How do I navigate that? If you can navigate MSU, it's a big, you know, uh, campus. You're going to be okay when you go to U of M or Eastern or Western or any of our Fair State, any of our good uh, state schools. So again, District 10 has the highest retention rate of 4-H in the state. St. Clark County is the highest retention county in the state, but all the counties had good retention numbers in the district. And the probably the county that had the most trouble was Lapeer traditionally, and things have really come turned around in Lapeer County in 4-H. So I am going to uh, just, I won't redo it. The next page just gives you a partial year update up through June of this year. It's the exact same data. You can read it faster than I can write. And we'll caution you that mid-year updates, you can't say, well, if I doubled it, it's more than last year. Let's, you can't do that because if something pairs is an updated, it can, which is our system, P-E-A-R-S, that's the acronym, um, it won't necessarily be current. But the trend is solid. It's We're right on pace for where we think we should be. Uh, and then, again, I'm going to have Betty Joe talk about the third page, and that gets into 4 H membership. So, with that. So, as Jerry said, the third page gets into membership. Um, this is the area of 4 H you're probably most familiar with that club model that we utilize volunteers. Um, our numbers, our 4 H year goes from September 1st through August 31st. So, we're wrapping up the end of this year. Um, probably pretty close to our enrollment numbers for this year. Um, so that third page is indicated we're at 688 youth currently enrolled in 4-H clubs in San Alec County. Um, that's pretty on course with where we've been the last two to three years. Um, so we were pretty, pretty excited that we came through COVID without losing a whole lot of numbers. Um, that can't be the case across every county, um, but we were able to maintain most of our youth numbers. Um, the volunteer number listed there, 240, um, that is down a little bit, but we do have some volunteers that we're still trying to reconnect with um, who took kind of a time out during COVID, stepped back a little bit, um, but we're continuing to reach out with those. Um, a couple numbers we did want to highlight in here um, that did not make it into peers yet because they are so new. Um, just within the last two to three months, we've been partnering with MedControl. Um, they've offered babysitting classes in the past, haven't been real successful in getting youth engaged. 
um, partnering with us. We're able to advertise it through our youth audiences. Um, just within the last couple of months, we've been able to offer five courses with them and reach 90 youth. So that's first aid and babysitting skills young people in homes are going to have to be able to utilize whether they're trying to be entrepreneurial or just helpful around their own home. Um, important, important skills for those youth. Um, the other one that's highlighted here is the youth quality or youth quality care for animals program. So that is a requirement that the youth have to have if they have an animal that they're taking to the fair. Um, we've offered five of those classes with almost 200 youth who've gone through those. So that deals with animal well-being, food safety, um, and the life skills that they learn through those animal projects. Um, I also today want to introduce, um, as Jerry had indicated to you earlier in the year, um, we are transitioning staff. Um, we do have a start date of next week, August 8th, for our new 4-H program coordinator. Um, so Mary Hyden is here with us today. Um, she will be our new 4-H program coordinator. Um, I also would like to invite up, we have three of our ambassadors here with us today. We have a senior ambassador, a junior ambassador, and a Cloverbud ambassador. So that would be a five to seven year old. Um, our ambassadors are in place to help us promote 4-H throughout the county um, with some of the core values of 4-H being citizenship, leadership, and service. One of their requirements is to come to a board of commissioners meeting. So, I will invite the three of them up if you want to come up and introduce yourselves. Just tell us um, your name and where you're from and what club you're in. Okay. Do you want to go first? Okay. Tell them your name. I'm Jacqueline. And then and what? I'm six years old. And I live in Michigan. Wait, I forgot where I was from. <laughs> okay. uh, Are you yeah. in I think I live in Okay. Good job, Devin. My horse is Little Rascal. Thank you, Devin. Thank you. And I'm in the work practice, and I love my horse, Dora. She's the best horse, miniature horse you could ever have. Her name is Dora? Uh-huh. Oh, I bet she's sweet. Uh-huh. And I have a dog named Cowboy. He was the best in dog practice, and, he, and we all get to have a wonderful time in my responsibility of the whole world, on our all responsibility to keep everyone safe. Good. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. Good. Wow. Thank you for being here. I'm Savannah Hudzinski. I am 17. I live five miles out of Ubley, so I'm, I'm considered Minden City. Um, I am in Border Breakers Unleashed, which is actually a branch club that me, my mom, and my younger brother had started because we found <coughs> holes in the area we were in for 4-H. Mm -hmm. I'm Emily Pettit. I'm 12 years old. I live here in Sandusky, and I show a miniature horse, a full-size horse, and a dairy cow. Nice. Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm the main street riders. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and I will turn it back to Jerry. Thank you. So I know we've tried the same thing. Why, why did we get almost 100 kids this year at the baby center? Mary put it on the radio and promote it. <laughs> yeah. Did, did you read it? Every year, and it's ever, their numbers aren't good, but I just want to say Mary took it upon herself to say, well, why don't we just use and work with local folks? And, you know, she got attendance instead of nine, it was 90. So did you guys just have a program for that last week? Yes. And well, then we have one tomorrow too. Okay. I think my daughter attended one last okay. week. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so we're filling them up fast, faster than I could get the information out there. We're filling them up. Okay. Mary had started this partnership before we posted the 4-H position before. I mean, it's, so it's just the type of person she is. She's shown a lot of initiative. Um, we had a very good candidate pool um, and we had, we always we look for in the, when we do a search we aren't we are looking for is this person capable of the job or not and then the institute helps make has to make the final decision we had multiple candidates that could meet the job and do the job well mary was the best candidate so she showed up for the first day she showed up every day yeah <laughs> showed up for because i heard that's not a thing <laughs> right i did well you know what i agree with mr brown whatever he is at but it's uh unfortunately it's there's a little different work ethic with, uh, whatever the letter they're calling this generation. So 
We've been blessed. I think most of our, in our extension office, I can say that uh, it's been good and solid, but I do know that what Mr. Brown said, I do know that to be true. Um, so uh, I also, I have one, uh, one more thing to leave with you, which I meant to a minute ago, and this is just kind of an updated, like, it's not a holistic, it doesn't include everything, but, but resources people can call, whether they're doing something with animal egg or crops or soybeans or wheat or you name it, um, any of the institutes. It's, a lot of this is online, but a lot of folks like handouts. So I'm sorry. I meant to, I should have given you that first time and I forgot. Um, I'll give you the other one too. Uh, so get this for Nathan. Um, I did want to say, I mean, obviously I just, when I got here, I got an email from Jody, um, which if I read it cor correctly, indicates so Mary's secretarial job is, is now going to be vacated in a week. And we wanted to backfill that. And I know we won't have to have the debate today, but I was just informed that you plan to not fill that position, which I, I think is disturbing on a whole uh, another level because it obviously indicates um, other things in, that you're considering. Um, so I guess I want to just say that I'm really, I'm disappointed and shocked given the value. We have, a, for the people in the audience here, we, we had signed a contract for $65,000 a year and you won't find another department where you get a better return on your dollar than MSU Extension. You won't, and I'd be happy to debate that with anybody. The guy was other, just here other, giving us that presentation. What, what was other, it? Other, other items. Good return on investment. If I can finish. Other, other things are necessary, required. You, you have to fund the police. You have to, I understand that. You won't find a higher return. $65,000 is nothing. You should, you should say, well, why don't we triple that if you can give us that much service? Because that's what this county is getting. Um, unfortunately, it's my belief that you have a vocal minority that continues to guide and drive the discussion in your county with an opinion that is not shared by the majority. There have been many mistruths uh, shared about the community and about me personally by members of your board of commissioners. And they have been even admitted. The most recent one is Jerry's resigning extension in August was never mentioned, never had that it's not my intention. It's never even uttered the words. And I hear that that's uttered, then I'm really shocked to hear it's a commissioner who shared, hang on. Chairman, I, I, a point of order here. This was a presentation and it's not becoming a presentation. And I would say that you know, on defense you of funding the board of commissioners who you're making allegations, I, I, I would say that we had an opportunity for you at 11 o'clock to present yourself with this very same information, you chose not to show up. I don't know why. We would have been happy to hear that. And whatever information you have in. about us not I filling am. a position can't be possibly true because we haven't had a decision on that because the meeting was absent with the primary vocal candidate that was pushing for that position. Mr. Chairman, I was not. There's no 11 o'clock meeting that I knew it, that I was supposed to be at. I'm right. sorry, I'm sorry, you were unaware. Yeah, I was unaware. Jerry, Jerry was certainly been. So. I guess, again, my point isn't that we're not going to debate all that here, but I there shouldn't just... shouldn't be a debate here at all, Jerry. I appreciate but, but, the chair. If the chair would please let me finish. Let Jerry finish, please. Um, I, I just think that we're fighting some needless battles here, and I really want... I just want us all to grow up and, and conduct things like adults. I know Commissioner Block, Chairman Block, you feel the same way. I've been very pleased with the conversations we've had. We don't want to go down this road, in my opinion. I don't believe your county wants to go down this road with extension down the millage path. That's you can certainly make that decision. We'll honor and go whichever way we have to go. But for the people and the voters and the taxpayers, again, my opinion is you do not get a higher value or return for your tax dollar than what we provide. We certainly recognize we can do many things better. We can do everything better, but we do a lot really well. And you can see we are serving your constituents and that there's just a, a lot of, again, chatter in the background. And when there's, when extension is discussed at a fair board meeting and extension's not there and commissioners are, we gotta have both sides there. So I just say, you know, I like to conduct things, you know, Mr. Block, I'm very direct, right? And I, I address issues right away with the people involved. So that's disturbing, we need to work together. That's all I'm saying. Well, I, I would hope, I would hope, Jerry, that you feel that I've done that way with you. You have, been. and well, and so as we move forward through this, consider me a direct line of contact for yourself, 
to reach out on behalf of the Board of Commissioners, and we'll continue to have this discussion in a professional manner. And if you're telling me that that the decision was made because I wasn't there since I wasn't invited, I would ask you to please reschedule that meeting, and I would most certainly attend. Okay. Thank you for being here, Jerry. You're welcome. Moving on, we have a presentation from our acting administrator of the Santa County Medical Care Facility, Ruth McAlpine, to present for a millage proposal. Um, before I go on, I do want you to know I did make some additional notes to my presentation, which is not on the handout I gave you. So feel free to do that, or I can give you a copy of my additional notes. Um, I, I do want to make a comment. I feel like prior to my coming up here with Mr. Brown, it was like something I hear every day in the nursing home industry. Our staff, we don't have enough staff. We got to go through red tape. The government, day in and day out, are changing the rules and. So I'm glad to see we're not the only ones suffering. But anyway, good afternoon. My name is Ruth McKelp. I am the acting director, um, acting administrator at Salat County Medical um, Care Facility. And I'm here today to request and ask for the board's approval of a renewal of 2.2 mills for six years to be placed on a November 2022 ballot for the Salat County Medical Care Facility. This request is for the MOE, which is not on your, your packet, the maintenance of effort, uh, invoices, and for the operational cost of the facility. The 0.2 mills has been supported by the voters of San Lac County when it was first established in 1999 and has been approved every time it's come up for renewal from the voters of San Lac County. This year, if approved and goes on the ballot will be 23 years that this millage, 0.2 millage has been operating. With the 0.2 um, millage, it's an average, the average taxpayer with 50 to 100,000 taxable value will pay anywhere from 10 to $20 annually for this millage. It's important to note the medical care facility, facility has been providing long and short-term care for the residents of San Lac County since 1968. We continue to offer numerous services and we continue and will be continuing to train our staff and other areas of nursing um, services that are needed that keeps the residents in San Lac County and they don't have to travel to another county, to another faraway city, which is a, a not only bad for the resident, but it's a hardship for also the family that have to travel that far. It's important to know that the medical care facility has been providing long and short-term care, as I said, since 1968. Currently, the average of 75% of our residents in-house are San Lac County residents. The facility operates on an average of 160 employees, in which 90% are San Lac County um, members or residents. With the facility members also, with their family members also working in the county and, and their, their children going to school. Our latest payroll, we, we did this, this in this past week, shows a gross of about $210,000, which means on the average, $5 million goes into this community from our employees, with 96% um, or 90% of that being San Lake County residents. So it's important to know, not only do we support the residents and their health care needs, but financially, we also do a big support for this community or this uh, county. It's another thing to note that 48% of our vendors, about 70 vendors, provide our resident services are local and reside within the county, which again, providing support to our local taxpayers, bringing in an average of about $1.5 million um, per year to the local community businesses. I have another final comment to make, and that is San Lake County Medical Care Facility is a vital, a vital part of this community, not only because of the residents we serve, but also because um, the contributions of additional revenue support for our community taxpayers to whom continue to support the San Lake County Medical Care Facility, your facility. That's kind of short and brief. I'm open to questions in case I didn't address a lot of the things that 
I think you you addressed some very good items in here, Ruth, and and I gotta give you and the medical care facility some credit. Uh, when I first got here, I didn't know much about it, um, didn't quite understand it, and and working with Kara and the rest of the team, I've learned a lot about the value that the medical care facility brings to this community, especially in the concept of 160 jobs, which are likely well-paying professional jobs in our community. So. Is there any further questions for Ruth? Hearing none, thank you very much for being here. Okay, at this time, we'll move on to appointment sustaining committees. There are none, there are no county chair appointments. So this will take us into general resolutions. <clears throat> and we have a resolution approving the Michigan State Police lease. I would open that up for any commissioner that wishes to read that. Today. I'll read that because that was one of the things that uh, Tara and I started about a year and a half ago. Very good. Uh, <clears throat> San Lake County resolution approving Michigan State Police lease. Whereas the Michigan State Police has uh, certain space requirements as necessary for efficient operation of business. Be it resolved, the Michigan State Police, except from Sanilac County, the premises known as the Michigan State Police, Sandusky Post, Sanilac County, Michigan, in accordance with the terms and conditions of certain lease and them. Further resolved, and, under, and the undersigned hereby certifies a county clerk, Leslie Hildendorf, is elected and qualified custodian of the records and seal of the Sanilac County deal form pursuant to the laws of the state of Michigan and foregoing its true record of your resolution duly adopted by the Sanilac County Board of Commissioners and signed by Board Chairman Jonathan Block at the meeting on this day, second day of August 2022. And that said resolution is now in full force effect without modifications or recession. We have a resolution presented from Commissioner Hebeling. Is there support for this resolution? Support. Support from Commissioner Ballard. Is there discussion? So could you summarize a little bit? You were Nate, you talked about it earlier, uh, grounds maintenance, snow movement, whatever it is, is it a cost allocation or is it in the contract on a yeah, well, um, as I said, Tara and I started looking into this probably a year and a half, maybe two years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think everyone knew that uh, the state police had been here. They've left, you know, they've reallocated resources. And I think this is basically a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, it's not a full-time post anymore. Um, satellite post. And so then we got looking into who was taking care of it. We quickly found out that we weren't doing building maintenance on it, but we're mowing the lawn, we're doing the shrubs. We're, uh, Roger, you, you was here forever, uh, yep. mowing the lawn, <laughs> taking care of things. And they own the building, as far as I know, we were doing all of the work uh, around the building and taking care of things. So uh, that was a cost to having at the time Roger was doing that, and I'm sure it was even before Roger. So we did contact, and I don't know the name of the lady at the, at the Michigan State Police Post, and she's, well, this was in, this was 2022. It would have been 2019 or 2022. She said, our budget's done for the year. We'll look at it next year. So that's when uh, Tara got into it a little more and handed it out to Nathan. So um, I believe, the number maybe we're looking at for them to have us take care of the grounds and take care of the lawn and fertilize it, whatever else, and the shrubs. I believe that's around what eight thousand dollars a year they offered up somewhere under. We we proposed that uh, if you don't mind, uh, we proposed that yearly fee to them. They uh, submitted us a, I guess, a cost per job. So each time they mow, each time we mow at one hundred twenty-five dollars a mow. Um, snow removal, $120 a plow, um, spring cleanup, they would give us $150, uh, fall cleanup, $150, and then sidewalks, um, $50 per removal. I ran some numbers. I mean, it's hard to predict how many times you're going to mow the lawn, hard to predict how many times snow, but it put us just over the $8,000 mark on averages. So I think we'll be somewhere in that range that we were looking for based on what they um, settled with so those are funds that we have now to put into the buildings and grounds budget 
to help pay for the services that we were providing before. That, that would be an addition to, yeah, that would be like revenue coming into the county, which would be nice. So that was an excellent thing for, you know, you getting going. Uh, so why provide those services for free if they're willing to pay us to do it? And that should more than cover the expenses. That's a lot of money to mow grass. Although the spring, the spring cleanup, I don't know if you get me out there with a rake for 150 bucks. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, whatever. Go ahead. <laughs> so here, if I got to bring it again, part of that cost allegation, well, cost appropriation program that Tara put into full effect, and, and we got a lot of pushback from a lot of different departments on that. But it seemed like the right thing to do, and moving forward, we, we continue to do that. And I remember it being brought up about that particular post. But listen, it says here that, that we've got a, a, a lease addendum. And I, did I miss it? Do I, does anybody have that? Is that... I've, I've got the lease addendum. We didn't put all the additional uh, documents in the packet, but I can provide that. Okay. It, it will in terms of the financials on it? Yeah. It, it, well, they had to have this approved resolution. Is it, it, tell me if I'm wrong, Nathan. Yes. This was the first step to get back to them officially so they could start moving on their own. Yeah. And that allows, you know, for the signature of this by... Um, Chairman Block, and then it spells out. I've got maps of like the grounds and stuff. I just didn't include that. So we need the resolution in order for us to move forward with the actual monetary reimbursement or what have you. Yeah, and it specifies the property here. I mean, we've got. I see that. Yeah. It's it, and we've even got the old deeds. We went to the deeds office to have the old deeds. Now you had mentioned that they own the building. Is that right? They, we own. They, we own. We own the building. Yeah. Did I say I that? They own someone the said they own it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. We do own. Yeah. But what I and I started out and I got next up. You know, that's a satellite building now. I believe out of care over the years, but before that was full time. And we're obligated to lease that to them, right? I, I think that's. I don't know. I don't know. I, I know that it was a contract probably signed at one point in time, and I don't know if we ever found that. I had Tara look for that contract so i don't know if it was for 10 years 30 years i don't think we still it, it own. didn't have an expiration yeah no, i don't know so there's a there's a, a, a lease that, term yeah that doesn't include the the maintenance right. i guess the, what we're getting for the maintenance. so this one does the following shall be added to the lease this is an addendum <laughs> and it says lease shall pay um the lease are for lawn maintenance and snow removal at the prices indicated on page two of the attached enclosure um but we're on the hook for providing that space to them for an undetermined period of time i don't think we're on the hook for it i mean we could if we if we found a use for that building that we said all of a sudden we think this would be a great building for whatever department we could we could move on that. I mean, we're not required to provide. That's that. what I'm asking. So this addendum doesn't place restrictions in terms of if we find a better use for the facility or a different use that we would be precluded from being able to move forward on that. No, and I, I consulted with uh, Brenda Sanford in the prosecutor's office because we had an initial proposal um, that they put a lot of restrictions within it on what they could do. And we said, we merely need an addendum to the lease. That's all we need. We need an addendum to the lease that says, we're gonna provide this service, you're gonna pay X amount for it. So that's what they decided to do, do the addendum. Um, everything else remains the same, so. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have a resolution presented, it's been supported, it's been discussed, is there further discussion? Hearing none, I need a roll call vote, Leslie. Commissioner Eberle? Yes. Commissioner Ballard? Yes. Commissioner Wyatt? Yes. Commissioner Sarkella? Yes. And Chairman Black? Yes. Motion is carried. Thank you. This time we will move on to resolution supporting Michigan Department of Natural Resources Trust Fund grant. Roger, would you like to read that? Sure. Uh, since I have countless hours in on this thing. <laughs> uh, be it resolved that the County of San Lac, Michigan does hereby accept the terms of TF 21-0183 project agreement as received from the Michigan Department of Natural Resources, MDNR, and that the San Lac County Parks Commission does hereby specifically agree, but not by way of limitation, as follows. Number one, to appropriate all funds necessary 
$160,400 to complete the project during the project period and to provide $80,200 to match the grant authorized by the MDNR. Number two, to maintain satisfactory financial accounts, documents, and records to make them available to the MDNR for auditing at reasonable times. Number three, to construct the project and provide such funds, services, and materials as may be necessary to satisfy the terms of said agreement. Number four, to regulate the use of the facility constructed and reserved under this agreement to assure the use thereof by the public on equal and reasonable terms. And lastly, number five, to comply with any and all terms of said agreement, including all terms not specifically set forth in the foregoing portions of this resolution. That's all I have to leave. Okay. Yes. We have a resolution presented by Commissioner Ballard. Is there support for this resolution? Support. Support from Commissioner Heberlein. Is there discussion on the topic? Hearing none, I need a roll call vote, Leslie. Commissioner Ballard? Yes. Commissioner Heberlein? Yes. Commissioner, Commissioner Sarkella? Yes. Chairman Black? Yes. And Commissioner Wyatt? Yes. Resolution is carried. Thank you. Moving on to committee reports. We will start with Commissioner Wyatt. Well, um, we had a personnel committee meeting today of sorts, which was referenced earlier, and nothing came out of that. Um, San Lac Transportation had its normal monthly meeting I attended, and an interesting point of note, um, the difficulty in obtaining materials and vehicles and what is continuing. Uh, we can't get any uh, bus chassis until 2025. So we spent roughly $32,000, no, not retrofitting, re remodding, um, rebuilding a bus chassis, 32,000 over at Hoekstra on the west side of the state. I mean, replacing frame channels and floors and I mean, really redoing it with the expectation that that'll buy us three, four years, I guess. And we're considering doing that on some other models as well. Um, but that's what's going on with that. Thank you. Roger. Uh, Parks, we have a meeting tonight. Um, currently uh, down Lexington, we have a uh, ADA bathhouse uh, project going on. Uh, I was over there yesterday. The floor has been poured in it. The sidewalks are poured and they're up about three courses a block. So hopefully here in the next several weeks, that project will be completed. Uh, on the 10th, we have a, a pre-construction meeting out there on the uh, stairway and the boardwalk, the ADA boardwalk. Um, hopefully they can get started on that shortly thereafter. Uh, what else? Oh, um, we're awaiting a site plan and cost projection. I believe I might have mentioned at the last meeting for Delaware Park um, to see if we can afford to apply for a million dollar grant <laughs> for that park. And our manager started at Evergreen Park a week ago yesterday and he's uh, been well received and he's doing a great job out there. He's very proactive and got some great ideas. So excited to have him on board. Very good. Thank you, Roger. <laughs> Uh, I myself had a planning commission meeting a couple of weeks ago with Commissioner Heberly. That was pretty boilerplate, a couple of PA 116 applications. The uh, planning commission continues to work, uh, their steering committee continues to work mm -hmm. on the master plan. Other than that, Commissioner Heberly and I did attend a fair board meeting to get a great understanding of some of the changes that they've made to the county fair. Um, that's all I have. Okay. And uh, most of you answered all my questions. Uh, Nick, to answer my <laughs> questions in regards to the steering committee, I'll just add briefly, quickly to it. Um, we have uh, Lisa Kenny. We've hired her, the county, to take over that for the master plan. She's doing a great job. Uh, we've got a great group of people that uh, she's brought on as far as the steering committee. And uh, I'll embarrass them a little bit. Uh, our city manager, Dave Faber, is part of that. Carl Ostentowski. So we've got some great leadership, great experience. And uh, uh, one of the things you already brought up is, you know, we look at housing in our last meeting extensively, what types of housing for our county, uh, internet, et cetera. So I, I'm really excited about uh, our new master plan and the people as part of it. Um, as far as the meeting this morning, uh, we had personnel. I think we covered that. We kind of heard about it a few minutes ago. I think we tabled that. We're not interested in that. And then uh, with the fair board meeting. So um, that's all I have. Thank you, Gary. Bill? 
Um, ironically enough, the HDC met, and so in discussion with them, uh, they're at 75 percent of their budget, reviewing some of their personnel policies because they're kind of in a similar circumstance with everybody else as far as staffing is concerned. But they have hired some people. Uh, they did acquire $600,000 in grants to deal with homelessness and assault crisis. And uh, they had to push their RFP back for an auditing firm because they can't get anybody to come in and bid to do the auditing for them. So once again, you know, it's just, and, and they, a couple companies that they've used in the past said, we don't have enough staff. We can't take on any more auditing um, responsibilities. And then they did hear back from UIA. There's a hearing scheduled, but they have not been given a date. So we're back to where they're going to go with the uh, senior services. Obviously, they've decided this year, at least for October 1, that they won't be providing with them. And they are working with, with um, the other organization to see if they can uh, come up with a resolution for that. And then uh, I attended in Lapeer, the Thumb Area Regional Community Corrections Board, which I was appointed to as a citizen and stayed on as a commissioner. And they approved their 2023 grant for $290,000. Um, they're looking at reducing their board size because when they started out, they were really large and it's been hard to get a quorum. So by reducing it, one of the requirements is going to be a commissioner from all four counties because Huron County is coming on board now. In particular, they're going to be involved with uh, the opiate and meth program, which um, is something that they've been very successful with. It allows 150 days rehabilitation program and, a, and an individual that's sentenced or going before the court can opt into that before they get sentenced and hopefully they come out clean. And the great thing about that program that they're having right now is there's follow-up. So you don't just get through the program, get rehabbed, and then they say, great job, you're on your own. There's going to be 12 to 15 month period where this organization that's providing that service is going to be with them, getting them plugged back into the community. And so they're hoping that along with that, our prosecutor and our judges will also be on board with instituting that here as well. And they're going to be making some presentations to them in the near future. Okay. That's all I have. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. If I could add one other thing. Uh, I attended the community mental health board meeting last week, and they've had some recent uh, great success at hiring staff, uh, some of their, their therapists and whatnot, the harder to fill positions. So they're getting back up to... Um, closer to normal staff levels, which is great news for them. They didn't happen to share their secret on how they found somebody to show up for work, right. did they? You know, I, asked them. They, um, I know they did a video, a recruiting video. Yeah. And uh, I think just persistence. Yeah. Very good. Good information, everyone. Thank you. At this time, we have no unfinished business, so we will move right on into new business. FA 051-21 was removed from our agenda, so we will start with FA 113-22. Santa Clara County Board of Commissioners hereby approves the payment of current claims for 2022 identified on the accounts payable report dated July 26, 2022 for the general bank account in the amount of $83,173.08. Support. We have a motion from Finance Chairman Sarkella. Support from Commissioner Ballard. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to FA 114-22, budget, adoptions, amendments, appropriations, and transfers. San Juan County Board of Commissioners hereby approves the following budget amendments and establishes the following accounts as listed. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella. Is there support? Support. Support from Commissioner Heberlein. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to FA 115-22, authorization for temporary employee county clerk's office. San Juan County Board of Commissioners hereby authorizes the county clerk hire Paula Messing on a temporary basis for the purpose of training and transferring her knowledge for up to 50 hours total at a pay grade eight step seven with funding from the county clerk's budget. Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella. Support from Commissioner Heberlein. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to FA 116-22, authorization for state-funded cost of living allocation. San Juan County Board of Commissioners hereby authorizes the state-funded 5% cost of living allocation to be paid in four quarterly payments to Kayla Franzel, Victim Service Coordinator. Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella. Support from Commissioner Ballard. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to FA 117-22, authorization for equipment certification and calibration cap drug task force. San Juan County Board of Commissioners hereby authorizes 
Metrome to service the tactic identification reader equipment at a cost of $1,995 for the annual certification and $460 for the replacement calibration cap. The total cost not to exceed $2,457 with funding for the drug task force millage. Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella. Support from Commissioner Ballard. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to FA 118 22, approval of child care fund life skills agreement. San Lai County Board of Commissioners hereby approves the current professional counseling center life skills agreement for fiscal year 2022 at a cost not to exceed $90,000 and further authorizes the board chairman to sign the necessary agreement. Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella. Support from Commissioner Heberlein. Is there any discussion? On yes. Uh, as I recall, this is a yearly contract, right? Okay. No, That's nothing, the way that I understand. Nothing it. was changed with that. Any further discussion on FA 118 22? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to FA 119 22, authorization to replace roof, Parks Commission. San Lai County Board of Commissioners hereby authorizes a change order from Stone Builders to replace the existing bathhouse roof at Lexington Park with standing seam steel roofing for immediate approval at a cost not to exceed $12,000 with money from the Parks Millage. Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella, support from Commissioner Ballard. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all in favor signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to FA 120 22, authorization and award bid for engineering, Parks Commission. San Lai County Board of Commissioners hereby authorizes and awards BMJ engineers and surveyors the bid for engineering of the Evergreen Sewer Extension Project at a cost not to exceed $64,300 with funding from ARPA funds. Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella. Support from Commissioner Ballard. Is there any discussion on the topic? Hearing none, all those in favor signal by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Moving on to NFA 038-22, authorization of ballot language medical care facility. San Lai County Board of Commissioners hereby authorizes the following medical care facility millage ballot question language to be placed on the November 1st, 2022 ballot. We have a motion from Commissioner Sarkella, support from Commissioner Ballot. Is there any discussion on the topic? We'll roll call vote, please. Sure. I will call. Is there any further discussion on the topic? Hearing none, roll call vote, Leslie. All right. Chairman Black? Yes. Commissioner Sarkella? Yes. Commissioner Wyatt? Yes. Commissioner Heberly? Yes. Commissioner Ballard? Yes. Motion is carried. Thank you, Leslie. Okay, that concludes new business. This brings into general public comments. Are there any general public comments today? Dave, welcome. Always good to see you. Good to see you. I think I was here the last time that Council on Aging was gave his presentation too. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, just uh, on behalf of the City Council, just uh, I read the paper I was gone last week. So sorry for missing the steering committee, but I was. Busy man. My family. So sounds like a good time. Yeah. <laughs> Internet didn't work on the beach. To, to <laughs> sorry. So, um, but on behalf of the council, we uh, we've been working with uh, the previous uh, sheriff and the current sheriff with trying to reduce the um, discharge of sewer from the jail, as you know, from the inmates and uh, flushing materials down the toilet and then it gets into our sewer system. Um, so we came up with a plan, and I noticed in the last paper that it was kind of put on hold, but uh, my, my council just urges that we potentially look at moving that forward so that we can uh, stop the discharge of the wrappers and, and trash and debris into our system, which causes us problems mostly at our wastewater plant and on our sewers. So uh, just on the yeah, city, I'm just asking for that. Um, and then to bring up about the airport, uh, uh, countywide airport, uh, it started probably about 10 years ago. Um, with all the tall structures starting to be the ITC line starting and everything else um, and trying to have a process and an appeal process before it was nothing over a certain height of the state they weren't allowed anywhere so the, uh, the airport county authority or actually yeah. is, um, allows for the appeal process and a review process because right now I'm dealing with the airport if if the, that was in place years, years ago, uh, we wouldn't be spending $195,000 to reroute Detroit Edison uh, because the poles are too high for the airplanes at the airport on the north side of it. And they would actually have an appeal process and a review process. Um, but it was brought to us um, by Aeronautics, by MDOT Aeronautics. 
um, and it's done throughout the state of Michigan, uh, that county board to, for reviewing those tall structures and, um, you know, whether it's Detroit Edison, ITC, windmills, uh, anything that's tall or certain height has to have a review process. So we've already had that appeals board review variance requests in the last five years? Yeah, I believe some of the last ones, I thought the Detroit Edison had some pole heights, of uh, some powder poles uh, that had to go in. Um, but I believe that it was a previous review. Um, some of them are done administratively, I believe, by Don, uh, and depend on, depending on what they are. Um, I don't know that whole law. I know enough to be dangerous. Um, and I've read it multiple times, but you know, I, I, I don't deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis. But that's really what it is, causes the review process so that you know, uh, windmills and uh, poles uh, too high don't end up in aeronautic space. Causing issue for our pilots. So, very good. Okay. Yeah. So, Dave, if I can just kind of add to what you said, David reached out to me. He's uh, Snusky's one of my constituents, mm -hmm. um, and I, and I understand you know where he's coming from, and 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 I related to Dave that we had looked at it as part of our ARPA fund uh, money for this um, waste thing, and we we bad we didn't so much back off, but we we were looking at possibly some. Grant funding to get that. And then and, you had a new administrator come yeah. in. So I understand, yeah. I just, yeah. you know, yeah. so um, this I, event, last rain event caused the, yeah. I mean, I got wrappers floating in the primary tanks right now that have to be hand netted out, you know. So uh, the only process to get it out once it gets to my wastewater plant is by uh, a metal rake or a fishing net. I mean, I'm familiar with. The wastewater treatment plants and um, i'm familiar with the debris i've been inside those facilities doing work and stuff so what about the rest of the users of that system and the trash that they'll be flushing down their toilets what what remediation so, are you going to do for that so really the the uh the main problem came from so we received a saw grant uh, i think it was 2017 2019 which allowed us to videotape and assess all of our sewers and that's when we noticed where the issue was coming from uh, and then so we, we've dealt with it from there. I mean, we do get the the, fl the flushable rags, which are the worst invention, in my opinion, ever made. I'm sure you see them at the campgrounds too, that they get into there and they tie up everything, you know. Uh, those we can't control, um, but things like plastic and wrappers, um, those are the, the, the big things because there's no way for me to treat it. Even, even the flushable wipes will eventually deteriorate and I can put in the sludge and then apply it to the landfill. Uh, the trash has no process to actually biodegrade and degrade in our system. Wouldn't this be part of your own infrastructure upgrade to facilitate some kind of mechanism by which you can do exactly what you're describing for the whole system rather than just for so one part? We do, so the wrappers end up flooding that out. So like this last rain event, if I don't have somebody standing, personally raking them off the bar grates, I potentially could have a sewer overflow because it'll fill up the whole chamber and, and go right to the county grade. So you're saying that Implementation of a filter system on part of, of the county, specifically the jail, will alleviate that in, in whole? Uh, for the moment, yes, for the most part. And we'll have some of the issue with the flushable wipes, but those are permitted in drain systems because they're biodegradable. Uh, but so, so the other issue is, is that, so the discharge of the plastics into the sewer um, is also a violation of the sewer ordinance. So, um, that discharge of plastic and non-biodegradable material is a violation of impairment, which would, you know, I mean, other communities would just say, hey, your sewer has to stop now until it, it, it gets fixed. Uh, we've been working, um, you know, previous sheriff and this sheriff have worked to try to reduce it down. Um, you know, we, it has gotten better. COVID got horrible. Um, but, uh, you know, we're, they've been working on trying to reduce it, but it's just, it's a- it's COVID a, it got horrible. What do you mean? Uh, they were flushing more stuff down the toilet. During COVID? Ryan, what's the deal with that? What the, what, what would COVID have? They're locked up. They're not. Well, because they were low, because numbers were half is what they're now. What I was told is, is that they were getting more commentary. Mostly it's commentary. It's yeah, it's yeah. I mean, you can identify coffee. honey buns coming from yeah. I mean, the, the coffee, office for the, sure. The coffee, the, the instant coffee has a sheriff symbol right yeah. up here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Day one did that start taking place when we started that when we put the new building up and uh, uh no it was present before but until we were able to run cameras down the sewer and find out the exact location of everything uh, that's really when we went through our whole asset management program we videotaped every single sewer we have uh, in our in our community and we have I gotta say I mean I want to push back on it but you got your ducks in a row Dave well done um, it's on us.
You might add chickens in a row, too. <laughs> yeah. Oh, don't bring a chicken ordinance on here. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Is there any other general public comments today? Uh, I do. I mean, we've got the jail administrator here. So what are we looking at doing to alleviate some of the costs that the county taxpayers through utilization of their ARPA funds or otherwise are going to have to do to implement this on the residents of that facility? Well, I, you know, what, we, what he's talking about is putting the system in outside based off our mains. I mean, ultimately in the jail to control it, I mean, we're, we're doing the best we can. We catch somebody doing it, we charge them criminally, but to monitor 70 toilets. I, I get it. Hours I get a day, it. 70 yeah. days a week yeah. with a staff of four people. You know, uh, How about a surcharge? I can give you that. I can give you an idea of what else yeah. can reduce the population. <laughs> <laughs> right. But nobody wants to go that route. You know? yeah. So, and ultimately, like I said, what we've, we've done, we can, you can't, it's areas you can't put cameras on, right? So you can't monitor that after the fact because it's a privacy issue. So when we catch them, they get charged criminally. But I mean, I as far as once it gets into the system, stopping it, I think that's our best alternative. That, that very topic's on the building the grounds committee. It is. We're yeah. agenda today. We'll be discussing yeah. it today. After this meeting. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about trash that could be um, recorded. They've got four honey buns and five coffees coming in. You better have the trash for four going out and five coming out. Unfortunately, it would require a lot of work on your end. We'd have paying new employees to be well, hired yeah, to take be, care of that. That would become a staffing nightmare. But what about just a just a, a simple? You're incarcerated here. Um, yeah, you got to pay a surcharge for something. I mean, you guys do charge people for being incarcerated, right? Mm, sure. But then, you know, I mean, obviously they're right, and it's going to be right into it. Yeah. I, well. So how do you charge me when I didn't do it? I can't prove it either, didn't. It's part of the infrastructure for the sanitary system in which you use. I don't know. I don't know. Kind of like a drain assessment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Well, we'll have that discussion later. Because, I mean, th this does come out of every taxpayer's alternative, pocket, alternative. in a sense. The devil's advocate to that is you have 90 inmates that don't ask to be here. They don't want to be here. This is where they're placed for us to move quite a bit of heaven. So to impose something on them, I, I just don't. Well, I think we already do. We, we do charge them for being housed or work release gets charged to special probably. Well, the county inmates that are sentenced yeah. to be here. Yeah. But the federal inmates, but that's a different story. Inmates, I get you. That's a good point. That's two to one our population. And they, they yeah. yeah, I follow you. Oh, Dave, we've identified as a real issue. Yeah. It's an ongoing issue. We got to figure out what to fix it, right? I just, yeah, I just don't want to see your brother back there. I just, yeah, we understand. understand. This rain event yesterday, I had to have somebody there personally down there raking it the whole time. Is this is this system that they're considering? Is this like a model system for problems like this? It, it, so it's really like big nets that catch it. So once it discharges into the sewer, it's big nets that catch all the debris over yeah. the wrappers. And then those are lifted out and put new nets in. They have the, a maintenance tool. And it's all done from above ground, so you don't right. have to yeah, wait. You hire a contractor or, um, you know, most likely a contractor to lift them out, dumpster. And then it goes right to our recycling center. You can take it wherever you choose. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Good Good public comments. Are there Thanks, any Matt. further? Hearing none, we're going to move on. We have no closed session today, but we do have an approval of closed session minutes. If everybody would like to review those. Everyone has had a chance to review. I'd entertain a motion to approve. So we'll support. We have a motion from Commissioner Ballard to support from Commissioner Sarkelli. There will be no discussion on that topic. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion is carried. Motion to adjourn. Oh.
Support. We have a motion from Commissioner Ballard, support from Commissioner Sarkella. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We are adjourned at 2.39. Thank you, everyone. Five minutes for finance. Yes, please. I'd like to run down to use the restroom. Dave, thanks. We'll be at a good hey, vacation. Dave, I, I actually did. My phone didn't really ring. Like, first time in 12 years, you know. Okay. <laughs> I got a question for you related to this county ordinance related to the um, air force. So I was in the air force today. I've never, never been in. Actually, just tell you what you said. You've got to go. I do. I'll take you out there. Next time. Um, is the village at all related to the zoning ordinance, or is that strictly a county issue? It's a it's county, county countywide. That, countywide. Okay. Airport uh, is a countywide ordinance. Okay, because Don and I, we just want to be, we know right. this thing is coming. Oh, right. yeah, the one of those 600 foot towers. Yeah. yeah. So we want to be prepared uh, with the first I'm sure that right caused Don to retire because he lives also by the way. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I think he's happy that, that I'm kind of helping him out here because we, 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 we got to make sure that board is prepared. And everything's set. Oh, so it's going to get contentious. You you be not set set right now, so but there's going to be some, some reasonable fees that are going to be collected. And he was in office. Right? Because we're looking at the numbers. Oh, he, he's, he's the one that 95 so request. So we're going to put 40 or 50 of them so in there. We have a bunch of our county policy. And so there's a 695. That's the permit. But if there's 50 of us, that's filling that vacancy. So we have an understanding that it's going to come to the treasury office. But I don't know that the county has a second. Dispersing to reduce the old. Yeah, I'm aware. And then where it goes. Where so I have to look at this next for two years. Yeah, so where those funds go back out. We just, you know, like, is it, it's right. Like, hopefully, then this is just a good savings account, right? They should, yes. they should be utilized. Now, John and I also discussed the board isn't being paid. Well, you, you can't have a board like that without per diems. So we're yeah. thinking between yeah. 50 and 100 dollars per diem. So that yes. fund could pay that. It could pay some administrative fees. We have the personnel. Um, we're just trying, trying to figure that out. And I want to make sure that whatever we come up with, I'm going to just kind of touch base with you on it. Yeah. Um, I haven't gotten through all that yet, but yeah. no, I'm sorry. Right. Um, I'm picking uh, it yeah, there you go. I'll bring it up. Very good. Uh, so I'll uh, when we get it all put together, I'll at least do it through you. So you know what's going on. Yeah, I don't usually see stuff through me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so it's Dave, because when we have we felt that the personnel can have the documents presented, I thought staff back then, maybe I'm not saying I thought oh, yeah, you're having the phone service and see with them are very limited. I thought that was one of the reasons. Having enough staff out. Well, yeah, the 500 probably came from a recommendation from M. Aeronautics. What's the guy's name? I forget his name. I don't, yeah. it don't matter. He's, he's no longer there. Oh, he's not. Uh, no. Okay. Well, it was but a, what it also allows is allows a appeal process. To reclass so like, what you said that. Yeah, so like, you know, so I don't really care so much that they're that. Okay. Okay. Really working on all of that. Lisa's helping me for ammo. Um, okay. Good. So 